everyone, I'm Stephanie Weaver, author of the upcoming Migraine Relief Plan Cookbook. Welcome back to the Blue and Yellow Kitchen. In each episode, I make a dish inspired by a new book while talking to its author. Today's book is In Every Mirror, She's Black, and I'm making Swedish cinnamon rolls. I'd like to welcome Lola Akinmade Orchestrum, author of In Every Mirror, She's Black. Welcome, Lola. Thank you, Stephanie. So excited to be here. It's great to have you in the kitchen. Can you give us a short overview of your novel? Absolutely. Uh, so in Every Mirror She's Black follows the lives of three very different black women who end up in Sweden for very different reasons. And they're all loosely connected by a white Swedish man named Yoni. And so the story does follow the lives of Kemi, Brittany and Muna. And we get to kind of live their lives, you know, through these words. So Very good. And tell us a little bit more about the three heroines, because I love that the book is a multiple POV novel. Um, tell us about each of the three of them and their background and how they ended up, just very briefly, how they end up in Sweden. Yes, sure. So when I wrote this book, I really wanted to tackle the Black woman experience from the career angle, the class angle, and the culture angle. So right away, I knew I had to create three very different women. So Kemi is a very successful marketing executive in the U.S., great at her job. But when it comes to dating and finding love, she sucks at it. And so she ends up in Sweden because Yoni's company gets into trouble, like an international PR fiasco. And Kemi is the one that can help his company. So he comes to recruit her. That's how she gets into Sweden. And Brittany is a former model turned flight attendant who Johnny meets on his flight, business class, and route to the U.S. And that starts that whole crazy relationship because he then just chases Brittany and becomes obsessed with her. That's how she gets to Sweden. And then Muna is a refugee who came from Somalia who lost her entire family on the trip uh, to Sweden. And she ends up in an asylum center that's funded kind of by Yoni and Yoni's family, and then ends up as, the jan as a janitor in his office. And so that's kind of how all three women kind of are loosely tied to this one character, but they also end up in Sweden for different reasons. Yes, and I just thought it was a brilliant way of dealing with those themes of class, immigration, um, alienation, trying to fit in, assimilation, learning the language you know you have two characters one who's coming from the u.s one who's coming from somalia they're both trying to learn swedish and and just all of the ways that that plays out so even though this book is set in stockholm it certainly is dealing with many issues that we're dealing with in the united yes. states so i thought yes. it was it was just so fascinating to me and the other thing that i just still can't even believe how many people turned this book down lola over 70 rejections of, 70. of the manuscript. Seven zero. Seven zero 70. rejections. Okay. Yes. So over that for, um, the, for the manuscript. And so thank you very much for sticking with it because I think it's a fantastic novel and which is why I want to feature it on the show. But also I think it just really speaks to part of the issue of publishing is what you were told was, well, we don't think, you know, middle-aged white ladies are going to relate to this book. Exactly. And I'm a middle-aged white lady, and I totally <laughs> related to this book. Yes. So, so all my middle-aged white ladies who are watching, you want to read this book. It is, Absolutely. it just taught me so much about, um, you know, the thing that's about literature is that it takes us into people's heads that we, you know, are different from us. It gives us into different situations. Um, and it illuminates uh, those issues in a way that feels very personal. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, and it, it's it's just a beautiful read. Uh, we don't do spoilers on the show, but I, I really encourage people to read it. Um, yes. Was there anything in particular that, that inspired you to write it? Like, was there kind of a, a reason you got started on it? Absolutely. So I've always written kind of fiction when I was younger before I became, you know, a travel writer and moved into uh, nonfiction. And so I was trying to rewrite some of those stories as an adult, you know, stories I wrote as a teenager with my adult voice, but I was struggling. And that's when I realized my kind of teenage fantasy was pretty much that fantasy. I wasn't really connecting to the characters as an adult. And so it was while I was on vacation, when I had finished reading another book, I said, you know what, that's it that the story I'm supposed to write at this stage of my life is a lot closer to my own experiences. And I've had a lot of experiences. I've lived, you know, in different places for long periods of time. I've traveled a lot. 
I know this culture well. I've written another book that kind of delves into the mindset of the culture. So why don't you write from kind of what you know? And so that's kind of how this book came about, you know, many of the experiences, many of the people, many, even this asylum center was based on a place I actually visited many times as a photographer, you know, working on a photography project with the asylees and the refugees. So that was kind of how the book came about. Very good. And so you are um, Nigerian by birth, lived in America and married a Swedish man. Did I get that right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. So you can see that even though none of these characters are based on Lola's life, she had so much rich uh, material to draw from. So um, exactly. it really feels so authentic to me as an outsider, like all these details about Sweden and, and that assimilation process and learning the language and all of that um, really makes this book so richly textured. So that's another reason why I wanted to feature it. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. And, yeah. and the one thing I also wanted to add is I'm also a travel writer. And what we do is we try to capture this kind of sense of place in our writing anyway. So I think that was also what helped in terms of writing this fiction, being able to capture a sense of place and then writing with a bit of urgency. Because as a travel writer, you get what, a thousand words yes. to write your story. Yes. So that was kind of how I was writing this Very with good. that intensity. Yeah. So um, so the recipe I'm making today is Swedish cinnamon buns, and we'll talk about the recipe and why I chose it after Lola reads. So I've asked her to read a passage from the book, and while she's doing that, I'm going to plate one of the cinnamon buns, and then we'll talk about it. So why don't you go ahead and set up what you're going to read for us, and then go ahead and read. Absolutely. So this is from page 164, and this is when Muna and Kemi kind of meet. I think they've met before, but this is the first time they kind of interact, right? So this is from Muna's point of view. Muna stood half hidden by the wall, observing the black African sister with the American accent. She was sitting in a corner, hunched over a laptop, studying something intently on the screen. On her desk was a takeaway latte cup from Espresso House. Muna studied her. She wasn't sure if she was feeling envy or pride. She banged closer to the latter. This woman seemed to be important here. Muna felt her heart swell. She had to say something to her. Propelled by admi admiration, Muna fully stepped out from behind the wall and slowly walked over to the woman. She was wearing crochet braids in loose coils and beneath her smart color colored blazer was a forest green pencil dress. Good morning, Muna greeted. She couldn't speak English, but she could pick out a few words in conversation. The woman said, shut up, and she regarded Mona with kind eyes and deep dimples. Mona guessed she was excited to see another black face. Good morning, she threw back before taking in Mona's uniform and the cleaning cat she had been pushing. Mona wasn't sure what came next after good morning. She just introduced herself. You're Heta Mona, she patted her chest. The woman patted her chest well. You're Heta Kemi, she said in bastardized Swedish that Mona instantly pitied. Muna wanted to hug her, to tell her more, that she was so happy to see her sitting here, there, that her colleagues were backstabbers, that Kemi was beautiful and confident, that her mere presence was giving Muna hope, that she wasn't going to be resigned to a life cleaning toilets. But all Muna could manage was, Taksumike, thank you very much, and a short wave before running off shyly with her cleaning cart as the woman stared after her. Thank you so much. So I wanted, I chose this passage because a few, a few reasons. It's that two of the three women are, are kind of meeting and talking for the first time. Um, the coffee is an important piece of this in terms of this, uh, the cinnamon roll. And also, um, I think it really delineated sort of the class uh, piece of this. So you have a woman who is a Somali refugee, she's cleaning the offices, and she's watching this black woman come into this office, um, doing her best to kind of be part of things, but not speaking Swedish, so she's really not part of things. And But Muna speaks good enough, English, or good enough Swedish that she understands all the stuff that the people in the office are saying about her. So, um, yes. so there's this interesting play of uh, the cleaning woman feeling pity towards the very well-off woman and exactly. also this but then you know they can't really be friends because of the, the the class that they're both in so that's why I chose the passage thank you so much for 
for um, for reading it for us so beautifully. And I'm going to show off these beautiful cinnamon rolls. <laughs> the whole Look amazing. kitchen smells so good. Um, yes. So the kitchen smells like both cinnamon and cardamom. So when I was mm, testing cardamom. these, when I was testing these, a couple people on Instagram said, well, how are Swedish cinnamon rolls different than like cinnamon rolls I might have had before? I think it's primarily the addition of cardamom, a spice that's very common in Scandinavian countries. And also they are, um, they're risen individually, so they're not in a big pan all together that you would use like a, um, either a, you know, a cupcake liner or, or a silicone cupcake liner. And then they have pearl sugar on top, which is, you can see these kind of chunks of the sugar. I'll walk back over so you can see them a little bit more. So that is um, something you can buy special here by order, or you can just do what I did and get some sugar cubes and mash them up with a <laughs> rolling pin. Uh, but the reason for this is that they don't dissolve when they're baked. So you get this a little bit of a crunch with them. So tell us while I taste them, um, what, uh, what is it about, uh, so the cinnamon roll is actually a big part of Kemi's experience, but also tell us yes. what fika is. Tell us about that, because that's really what I wanted to talk about. Absolutely. So fika is a very ingrained Swedish culture, uh, cultural kind of lifestyle thing where people take breaks, several, they call them fika breaks, with, uh, you know, several times during the day. To just kind of stop, recalibrate, take a pause, you know, say I'm speaking Swedish now, take a pause <laughs> with, uh, you know, friends or colleagues or family to just kind of recalibrate and rest before going back to work. So it's a way of, it's a very social um, kind of institution here, yeah, you know, and Fika is really revered. It's one of my favorite parts of the culture where you just, and it kind of, even though it seems like oh, it's fun taking coffee and, and breaking for cinnamon buns, it's actually a way of recalibrating so that you're always balanced. You know, if everybody has an internal skill, it's a way of balancing so you're not working too hard, you're not stressing too hard, you're just taking moments to rebalance your internal skill yeah. and then get back. So I love it. That's fantastic. And I, th I wish that we did this in America because I think everybody needs some balance <laughs> and recalibration. Um, but also yes. later in the story, Muna imagines, fantasizes about asking Kimmy out for coffee and then realizes that she really can't do that. She can't cross that divide. So, um, so that is, you know, she, she's sort of hoping they can be friends because they're, you know, there's only two black people in this office and she thinks maybe we can yes. be friends, but they, she really can't ever cross that divide. And loneliness is a big uh, theme in the book as well, loneliness and displacement. So I wanted yes. to describe these. So um, the whole kitchen smells like uh, both cinnamon and cardamom. So those very warm spice notes. You get the, um, so it's a very yeasty, tender dough. So when I took a bite, it's, there's a lot of delicious chewing. Um, but you get the yes. kind of the cardamom first because it's a little bit stronger spice. And then the cinnamon is kind of the back note. And then you get a little bit of crunch from those sugar pieces on the top. So delicious recipe it will be up um, you'll find the recipe in my in the comments on Facebook and in my bio on Instagram okay so um, anything else any last moments oh and then my recipe tips you want to use really high quality cinnamon and really high quality cardamom if you can so because they make a huge difference and so I love in Vietnamese cinnamon from Penzi spices and I actually got um, actually ground fresh cardamom pods. So I think that's partly why, even though there's not a lot of cardamom in it, it really has that super strong. beautiful, strong, strong in a good way. Yeah. If you like cardamom, yes. if you don't, you can leave it out. But for me, it's what sets these apart and makes them taste different. Um, and then the only other thing is just make sure you let them rise until they are fully doubled in size. And, and my yeast was a little bit slow. So it took much longer than the recipe initially called for, but you get this, you know, really beautiful buns at the end. So that's great. Um, anything, any last uh, notes you wanted to give for us today? You mean in terms of the cinnamon buns? Oh, no, 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 about the book. About the book. <laughs> <laughs> about the book. <laughs> yes. No, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a, you know, it's a book that's very nuanced, you know, and I think you, when I read that passage, you know, about Mona and Kemi meeting, there was just a lot of nuance you could pick up where even, you know, Mona was feeling, uh, sorry for Kemi. So it's a, it's a very layered book. It's a book I wrote 
with very direct, tight prose because I really wanted people to remember the characters at the end of the book and their lives instead of saying, oh, the, the author wrote with this exquisite prose. That wasn't the point of this book. The point is, I want you to remember Kemi, Brittany, and Mona. So and, that's all I'll And they I'll are add. all three unforgettable. Lola, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Stephanie. My pleasure. You'll find the recipe link in the Facebook video or on my website, migraineleafrecipes.com, and in my bio if you're watching this on Instagram or you found me on Twitter. You'll find her at akinmade.com. And if you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend. Order a copy of In Every Mirror, She's Black wherever you like to buy books. And if you don't have a book buying budget right now, please ask your local library to carry it because they purchase the books and that helps authors as well. Follow me at sweavermph and like my Facebook page so you don't miss an episode. Join us next time for another author interview and a dish inspired by their book. Thanks so much for watching The Blue and Yellow Kitchen.